Good evening. My name is Manish Mehta, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors of Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this month's Speaker Series event. February is Heart Month, so it is fitting that tonight's talk is focused on the topic of managing heart rhythm disorders. I would like to take this opportunity to say that at Sunnybrook, our mission is to care for patients and their families when it matters most. Sunnybrook also cares about our collective responsibility to achieve reconciliation with Indigenous peoples who have lived on this land for generations. We acknowledge our campuses are located on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and ancestral and traditional lands of the Anishinaabeg, Ojibwe Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and Huron Wendat nations. Today, this land is home to many First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and urban Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We value the contributions past and present and we are grateful to work in the community on this territory. So why are we discussing heart rhythm disorders? Well, irregular heart rhythms or arrhythmias affect many people. There are several different kinds of arrhythmias, but tonight our experts will focus on one of the most common, which is atrial fibrillation or AFib. According to the Canadian Cardiovascular Society, as many as a million Canadians live with atrial fibrillation which can lead to adverse health impacts, including stroke, heart failure, especially among the elderly. The society estimates that in addition to human costs, AFib and its related care costs about a billion dollars a year in healthcare budgets. The Schulich Heart, the Schulich Heart Program at Sunnybrook is one of Canada's preeminent cardiac and vascular care centers, known for driving innovative ways to diagnose and treat the heart and damaged blood vessels. Tonight, you'll hear from three cardiologists from the Schulich Heart Program. They will share their insights on what AFib is, how we diagnose it, and some of the best treatment options for patients. The discussion will try to answer some key questions, including how can you tell if you have AFib? What does it mean for day-to-day -day life? And what are some safe and effective technologies or procedures to help manage it? We are fortunate to have Dr. Harinder Vijayasundara moderate this event. Dr. Vijay Sundara is Chief of the Sula Card Program and Head of the Division of Cardiology at Sunnybrook. He's also an interventional cardiologist and a senior scientist at Sunnybrook Research Institute. In addition, Dr. Vijay Sundara is a professor in the Department of Medicine and the Institute for Health Policy, Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. His research and professional interests include clinical evaluation and effectiveness, medical decision-making and cost-effectiveness analysis, and health technology assessment. Dr. Vijay Sundara holds the Canada Research Chair in Structural Heart Disease Policy and Outcomes, and in 2022, he was appointed the inaugural Ontario Health Core Health Provincial Physician Lead for Cardiac Care. This is just a brief snapshot of Dr. Vijay Sundara's biography. We are in excellent hands having him moderate tonight's panel discussion. Arinda, thank you so much for being here. I'll now pass the microphone and, and event over to you. Thanks so much, uh, Manish, for that introduction. And good evening to all of you for joining us to learn about heart health, managing heart rhythm disorders. Uh, as all of you will hear shortly, Sunnybrook has really a leading expertise in caring for people with irregular hearts, uh, heartbeats, uh, such as atrial fibrillation or what we call AFib. Uh, in the Schulich Heart Program, we provide comprehensive, comprehensive care for some of the most complex cardiac and vascular cases in Ontario, and we pride ourselves on really treating the full spectrum from prevention to interventions and long-term management. And AFib is one of the areas that our clinicians have deep knowledge in, and you're going to meet three of them shortly. Uh, you'll learn uh, over the course of uh, the next couple of hours why atrial fibrillation is so important, and you will come away with an understanding of the, some of the new and minimally invasive technologies for diagnosing and treating it. Dr. Sheldon Seng will start things off by providing an explanation of what AFib is, why is it a health concern, what its symptoms, and some of the ways in which it can be treated. Of course, before you can treat a condition such as atrial fibrillation, you really need to know if you have it. And that's where our second speaker, Dr. Christopher Chung, will be speaking on. Uh, an area of his expertise and interest is exploring some of the new technologies out there, such as smartwatches or wearables, 
and ways in which these new technologies can detect and help us manage this condition of AFib. And finally, Dr. Maria Terracatis will share an overview of safe and effective treatments uh, for uh, atrial fibrillation, specifically ablation, to walk us through uh, how this common and minimally invasive procedure works and what are the things in the horizon uh, that are coming. Uh, I'm really proud and uh, of our physicians in this area and also that this, that Sunnybrook has invested uh, lots of new resources into our electrophysiology program, uh, which carries out procedures such as ablation. Um, in February, we're very proud that we celebrated the opening of a state-of-the-art EP suite, which has allowed us to uh, really expand our capacity, almost double it, uh, for patients such as with conditions such as atrial fibrillation. So as you can tell, there is a lot to discuss. And we'll make sure that at the end, we have uh, some time uh, for you to ask questions and to discuss some of the, uh, uh, some of the presentations that you'll hear. Uh, so thank you to all of you for attending. Thank you for those who have uh, submitted a question online. And please feel free to send questions during uh, the speaker series webpage while the presentations are going on. Uh, we won't be able to get to every question, but uh, I'll certainly try my best uh, if we have uh, enough time available. So to begin, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, so Dr. Sheldon Seng is a cardiac electrophysiologist uh, at the Schiller Card Program, and he specializes in treating complex arrhythmias, among other conditions. He serves as the medical director of our electrophysiology program, as well as our left atrial appendage occlusion program, which is um, another program designed to provide minimally invasive treatments for patients who have atrial fibrillation and uh, may have blood clots. He is also the lead of our clinical trials unit. He is a trusted expert in the treatment of atrial fibrillation, and we're really very fortunate to have him in the program and fortunate to have him here speaking to you about this area uh, that he has deep expertise on. So with that, Sheldon, thank you for joining the panel, and I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Richard, for the introduction, and thank you to everyone for taking time out to join us today. So my charge in the next 15 minutes is to talk about atrial fibrillation and what it is. Um, uh, the objectives are, in the next few minutes, are to talk about what is atrial fibrillation, why it matters, and give you a brief overview about how atrial fibrillation is treated. So atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia globally. Normally, the heart has top and bottom chambers, the top and bottom chambers beat in sync with blood flowing from the top chambers through the valves to the bottom chambers. Atrial fibrillation occurs when the top part of the heart beats in a very erratic or unsynchronized fashion. This results in variable blood flow from the top to the bottom chambers of the heart. It can result in the heart beating too fast or paradoxically too slow, and this lack of contracted um, uh, organized activity can result in symptoms. Again, this is the most common arrhythmia globally. It's estimated that around three to 500,000 Ontarians have this, but this number is just an estimate because many people aren't aware that they have this problem. <clears throat> atrial fibrillation is classified based on the duration of the arrhythmia. Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is atrial fibrillation that starts and stops on its own. Typically, patients have periods of normal rhythm, and then these paroxysm of symptoms uh, due to the irregularity. Persistent atrial fibrillation typically occurs when the arrhythmia has lasted a longer period of time. And in general, this is an arrhythmia pattern where the arrhythmia starts and typically does not stop on its own spontaneously. In situations like this, drugs or electrical cardioversion or otherwise known as a shock to the heart are needed to restore normal rhythm. And finally, permanent atrial fibrillation is a situation where someone has this arrhythmia all the time and the decision is made not to do anything about it since they seem to tolerate it relatively well. In terms of the causes of atrial fibrillation, there are electrical and structural changes to the top portion of the heart. It's these electrical changes which provide the substrate for this arrhythmia to occur. In certain situations, triggers can occur that can result in atrial fibrillation. We don't really know what causes atrial fibrillation, but there are some situations which are associated with the arrhythmia. Age is probably the most common risk factor for atrial fibrillation, 
As you get older, many patients get progressive structural changes to the heart, which predispose them to this arrhythmia. There is a genetic component to this, but we don't know what the genetics are specifically. We know that patients who have a parent with atrial fibrillation, they tend to have a higher risk of having atrial fibrillation compared to those without a first degree relative with atrial fibrillation. But we don't know how to modify these genetic risk factors and we don't know all of the genes that contribute to this. Other medical problems can contribute to the arrhythmia. Lung disease, renal disease, heart failure can all play a role in atrial fibrillation. Patients who are overweight also have an increased risk of atrial fibrillation. And indeed, weight loss has been shown to decrease the frequency and burden of atrial fibrillation. Thyroid dysfunction is a condition which is a reversible cause of atrial fibrillation and important to recognize in patients. Then there's some lifestyle factors that contribute to the arrhythmia. Particularly, alcohol is one potent risk factor. And we know for every additional glass of alcohol that one drinks, the risk of this arrhythmia increases. Indeed, there are situations where one can binge on alcohol and have a phenomenon called holiday heart syndrome, which is where we frequency these arrhythmias at the time of holidays such as Christmas or New Year's. Although weight loss and exercise can definitely reduce your risk of atrial fibrillation, it's well known that excessive exercise can increase that risk. And we often see this in young, high-level endurance athletes who have atrial fibrillation despite not having other risk factors for the arrhythmia. Diagnosis of atrial fibrillation is not easy. And the gold standard is having an ECG recording showing this irregular abnormality within the heart. This is a tracing where you see on the top level, you have this irregular undulating fibrillatory pattern in the atrium, which is the low amplitude signals. And this is a tracing of normal rhythm where you have a nice atrial activity prior to every ventricular activity. So instead of that irregular heartbeat in, you have a nice regular heartbeat with organized activity prior to each contraction of the heart. So to have an ECG, you need to know when to have this ECG. And many patients don't have symptoms, so it's, they're never prompted to actually seek out attention to, um, uh, to obtain documentation of this. We frequently screen with ECGs in patients who have symptoms of palpitations, shortness of breath, extra heartbeats. Patients with stroke, we often screen them for this arrhythmia given that it is associated with stroke. And if you have any of the other risk factors that we spoke about, um, uh, we tend to have a more vigilant um, uh, approach to patients to screen in this situation. You as a patient can screen yourself by doing pulse checks. Simply placing your uh, fingertips on the radial aspect of your hand, you can palpate the pulse. And you can get pretty good at telling when the, your pulse is regular and irregular. Dr. Chung is going to talk about commercially available devices, but there are many devices out there on the market right now where you can test for atrial fibrillation. Gizmos such as the Cardia Mobile, which synced to your smartwatch, or so your, your uh, iPhone or your Android device, can give you a tracing of the ECG. And commercially available blood pressure cuffs also have algorithms in place to help you detect if you have this arrhythmia. If you are diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, there are other tests your doctor may want to do. Blood tests such as thyroid level measurements are important to ensure that you do not have a reversible cause of atrial fibrillation due to a hyperactive thyroid. And as well, your doctor may want to look at your kidney and your liver function as different therapies that we use to treat atrial fibrillation are impacted by your kidney and liver function. Your doctor may want to obtain an echocardiogram and indeed, Nearly all patients who have atrial fibrillation get screened with an echocardiogram to look for causes of atrial fibrillation, such as valve abnormalities or consequences of atrial fibrillation, such as the development of a weak heart. Hole to monitors are frequent tests that are employed by your doctor. And this is done to help your doctor understand the burden of your arrhythmia and help them obtain correlation with your symptoms to know that it indeed corresponds to atrial fibrillation. We know that sleep apnea is associated with high blood pressure and also atrial fibrillation. So your doctor may ask you to undergo a sleep study. And finally, some of the, the therapies that we use to treat atrial fibrillation are impacted by other cardiac conditions such as coronary artery disease. So it would not be unusual for your family doctor to screen for other coexisting heart disease. In terms of the consequences of atrial fibrillation, one of the main consequences are symptoms or what patients feel. And, you know, 
heart doesn't always pound out, pump out of your chest when you have atrial fibrillation, but, but that is the most common symptom that patients have, palpitations or fluttering in the chest. But you know, other symptoms can exist with atrial fibrillation, such as vague symptoms of chest pain, shortness of breath, lightheadedness, but a lot of patients have no symptoms at all. And this makes it challenging to make the diagnosis and understand the burden of the arrhythmia. Other consequences of atrial fibrillation are healthcare consequences or bad things that can happen to you when you have this arrhythmia. Stroke is one thing that we worry about the most as patients with atrial fibrillation have an increased risk of stroke. The rate of stroke is around four to 6%, and that's generally higher than the population without atrial fibrillation. That risk of stroke is further increased in a patient who has AFib when other healthcare conditions are present, such as older age, the presence of heart failure, high blood pressure, diabetes, or if you've had a stroke before. Heart failure is another consequence of this arrhythmia, and this can happen in the setting of a normal heart where the absence of normal contractile activity between the top and bottom chambers results in blood backing up into your lungs, making you quite short of breath. But in some patients where the heart rates are very fast, you can get a weakening of the heart muscle and a weak heart pump function. While those are the extreme consequences of atrial fibrillation, a large number of patients actually do well and have no adverse health consequences as a result of having this arrhythmia. <clears throat> Our treatment is aimed to improve symptoms and decrease the risk of adverse consequences such as stroke. Our primary approach is to reduce the risk of stroke and this is important because stroke associated with atrial fibrillation is often worse than regular stroke, okay? In general, patients who have atrial fibrillation, they um, uh, require some sort of therapy to reduce the risk of stroke. And that need for therapy is highest in patients who have risk factors such as diabetes, high blood pressure, a weak heart, or who are elderly. In general, patients who are more than 65 years of age who have this condition, warrant therapy to reduce the risk of stroke. Our most common way to reduce the risk of stroke is using blood thinners. And this ranges from the old school blood thinner warfarin, which many of you know as rat poison, to newer blood thinners, which, which are much easier to take. <clears throat> what these blood thinners do is they thin the blood generally, but there's a little outpouching of the heart called the left atrial appendage where these clots tend to form preferentially. And the hope is by thinning the blood and preventing clots from forming in this area here, you can reduce the risk of stroke. There are newer non-drug approaches to prevent stroke that capitalize on the fact that we plug up this little area where the clots form. And these are left atrial appendage closure devices. And we use them in patients who generally cannot to tolerate oral anticoagulation due to risk of bleeding. <clears throat> Your doctor may want to treat your arrhythmia by slowing down your heart rate because frequently a lot of the symptoms are due to fast heart rates. So it would not be unusual for your doctor to consider drugs such as beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or digoxin. While we want the heart rate low, we want to avoid too low heart rates because there are obviously bad things that can happen with very slow heart rates. So at a minimum, we want to ensure your heart rate most of the time is less than 110 beats per minute. Very rarely, there are patients where we cannot achieve slow heart rates with the use of these pills. So they may require a pacemaker and a simple procedure called an AV node ablation, which allows the pacemaker to regulate your heart rate. There's some patients where just simply slowing down the heart rate is not sufficient to control their symptoms. In this situation, we want to maintain normal rhythm. And there are two main approaches we use to maintain normal rhythm. One is using drugs, the other is an ablation. There are many drugs that are available on the market to treat atrial fibrillation. In general, these drugs work in about 40 to 50% of patients, and they have varying side effects, some which are nuisance side effects and some which are life-threatening. Ablation is a non-drug way of trying to control the arrhythmia. And again, there are various modalities to treat this, such as burning the heart, freezing the heart, other different technologies, including surgical technologies. It is slightly more effective than drug therapy, and studies have shown that about 50 to 80% of people will have a good result after an ablation procedure. Much like drugs have side effects, procedures have risks, and some of these risks are life-threatening. 
When you look at comparing drugs to ablation therapy, we know that with ablation therapy, because it's a bit more effective, there is an improvement in symptoms compared to drug therapy. Patients have fewer hospitalizations. And in some patients, particularly those with a weak heart and symptoms of heart failure, they may actually live longer. Once the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation is made, it's important to recognize that this is a chronic condition and you'll be living with it for the rest of your life. So you will need routine follow-up and routine care to ensure that nothing has gone wrong. Your doctor will want to keep an eye on your heart rate intermittently, assess the burden of your arrhythmia. For patients on blood thinners, blood tests will be done intermittently to ensure the safety of ongoing use of these blood thinners. Any changes to your health, such as the development of new conditions, will impact the treatments that we use for atrial fibrillation. And depending on your symptoms, which may change with time, there may be a need to escalate therapy. <clears throat> atrial fibrillation is evolving, and we do research to ensure that patients are receiving optimal care. And here at Sunnybrook, we're fortunate to be involved in many studies looking at improving the care of patient, patients with atrial fibrillation. We're currently doing work looking at using a registry to study the risk of stroke in patients not on blood thinners. And this is important for us to ensure that the risks of stroke that we've quoted based on older data still persist. Dr. Chung and myself are co-investigators on a study looking at a newer blood thinner, which has a lower risk of bleeding. I'm collaborating with my interventional cardiology and neurology colleagues, looking at the combined use of blood thinners and left atrial appendage closure devices in patients with AFib to see whether or not this double approach as a reduction in the risk of stroke compared to just using blood thinners as we traditionally do. Dr. Chung will be spearheading a new study to look at a new tool to screen for atrial fibrillation soon at Sunnybrook. As well, our work goes beyond the clinical work and Dr. Terry Cabras has an active animal lab where she evaluates new tools that we will be looking at using for clinical um, treatment of atrial fibrillation down the road. So in summary, atrial fibrillation is very common. Screening is important. There are many ways to treat atrial fibrillation, which require conversations with you and your healthcare practitioner. And we do research at Sunnybrook to try to improve the care of patients with this arrhythmia. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Sheldon, for that really comprehensive overview, both of atrial fibrillation and all of the work clinically and otherwise that we, we do at Sunnybrook. Um, so it's my pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Christopher Chung is a staff cardiologist and another one of our uh, cardiac electrophysiologists in the heart program. Uh, he is an associate scientist at the Sunnybrook Research Institute, and his interests focus on atrial fibrillation and complex arrhythmia management, wearable devices, and digital health. In addition to these roles, he is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, we're very glad that he's here to talk to us about uh, his expertise on, uh, on wearables. And uh, with any, without any further ado, Chris, I'll, I'll hand the mic over to you. Great, thank you very much, Rindra, for the introduction. And thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, so my topic today will be on smartwatches and other wearables. We'll talk about new technologies for detecting and managing atrial fibrillation. So as uh, as Rindra mentioned, I'm a cardiologist and cardiac electrophysiologist here at Sunnybrook. So to start off, I, we heard a little bit about this from Dr. Singh already, uh, that uh, arrhythmias uh, generally uh, can have a variety of symptoms. They can begin with palpitations uh, all the way to fatigue or to loss of consciousness. And it's important for us to detect arrhythmias because arrhythmias can be associated with significant morbidity. Uh, and that by morbidity, morbidity, we mean that arrhythmias can be associated with injuries, uh, or cardiac complications such as a hospitalization uh, because of the arrhythmia. And as, uh, as Dr. Singh mentioned earlier, arrhythmias can be paroxysmal in nature, which means that they occur intermittently, or they can be persistent or permanent, meaning that uh, someone is, is, is in arrhythmia constantly. And now how do we work up an arrhythmia? We heard a little bit about this already. Typically when we see uh, someone for an arrhythmia, there is a, we, do a, what we call a comprehensive cardiac evaluation. And so this begins with a medical history, a physical examination, and then a series of tests that we run. And so that starts off with an EKG or an ECG, an electrocardiogram, that's what we call, uh, some form of monitoring, and then also often some cardiac imaging, what we call a cardiac ultrasound or an echocardiogram. 
And a critical part of diagnosing the arrhythmia is monitoring the arrhythmia and recording the exact rhythm that happens when someone has symptoms. And so that's what we call achieving symptom rhythm correlation. We want to have the symptoms associated with the arrhythmia that we detected. And typically, how we achieve that is through cardiac monitoring. So what are our options for cardiac monitoring and what does it look like in 2024? So believe it or not, the Holter monitor was, uh, was invented more than 70 years ago. And so this device was initially the size of an entire room. Uh, then it was the size of a backpack, and as you can see here. And of course, since then, it's been miniaturized uh, to, to a handheld device that can be attached. Uh, but now in 2024, we have a lot more options for monitoring. Uh, and I, I, we've, I've drawn the schematic here to give an example of all the options that we have for cardiac monitoring uh, in 2024, ranging from on the left, those are our single time point or short duration monitors. In the middle, those are our intermediate duration monitors. And on the right, those are our longer duration or continuous monitors. So starting on the left, a single time point monitor would be an example like an EKG or an ECG that you have done at the cardiologist's office. You can also purchase devices that are handheld ECG devices. You can record your own ECG at any point in time. And then there are, all, are also a lot of handheld uh, apps on mobile phones that can record uh, uh, your uh, pulse based using the smartphone camera uh, and then infer, infer your cardiac rhythm. Now in the middle, those are the intermediate duration monitors. So a Holter monitor fits into this category. Of course, it's now miniaturized now, and so it's much more compact. Uh, but it does still have several wires associated with, and often this is something that we use very commonly for monitoring anywhere from two, uh, two, uh, one, uh, 24 hours up to 14 days. But we also have new devices like patch monitors. So a patch monitor is something that can be stuck uh, on your chest uh, and can monitor your heart anywhere from 7 to 14 days and often can be returned or mailed back to the manufacturer for analysis. And now finally on the right, those are our longer and continuous monitoring devices that we have available. So uh, on the top, on the, on, the, on the right here, we have what we call implantable cardiac monitors or implantable loop recorders. And these are tiny devices that are almost the size of a USB or less, and then we uh, put them under the skin and they can monitor your heart for anywhere from two to three years uh, to look for an arrhythmia, especially if the arrhythmia is happening very rarely or intermittently. Uh, but what's very exciting in this space is that of course we now have smartwatches and smartwatches may be very similar to these devices, but be very instead be a non-invasive option that allows for near continuous monitoring of your heart without having to undergo a small procedure or have this device placed. The smart watch may be a, a, an interesting modality that may achieve near continuous monitoring. And with that in mind, uh, the next part of my talk will talk about, about how can we use these wearables as part of your health. And so it, it goes without saying that wearables are now available for all sorts of different uh, purposes. They can be found on all parts of our body, uh, as you can see on the schematic here. Uh, and, and it also goes without saying that ha there has been an explosion of wearable devices over the past decade. We've seen smart these smart electronic devices now uh, created for a variety of uh, for for monitoring a variety of physiological parameters uh, and for activity tracking in, in a number of different uh, uh, in a number of different uh, shapes and sizes. Uh, so what can I what can we measure with a wearable device? I've included a list here on the right, but this is certainly not extensive, not exhaustive, because we are seeing new and newer and newer uh, functions being added on as we speak. Uh, so for example, we can have heart rate monitoring, we can have uh, physical activity tracking and step counters, uh, calorie counts, uh, oxygen saturation levels. Um, arrhythmia detection, which we'll get into a little bit, such as AFib detection, um, blood pressure monitoring, uh, blood glucose monitoring, sleep patterns and strain, um, seizure detection as well, fall detection and more. Uh, and so what's exciting is that I think that these wearable devices will have more and more clinical parameters and diagnostics that we'll have available. And in some ways, I think they do change how we deliver healthcare. Uh, you know, how wearable technology provide for what I call, would call a near continuous monitoring. And by monitoring uh, individuals for longer periods of time, we can increase our monitoring yield and increase the likelihood that we'll pick up an, an arrhythmia at something that may, be, uh, it may explain somebody's symptoms. So if somebody, uh, an individual is having symptoms intermittently, um, a conventional monitor may not be able to pick that up because they're happening so rarely. A monitoring device like a wearable may be able to theoretically pick that up if it's applied at the right time. Now on the right here, this is an example of how uh, wearables, I think, are really reshaping how we deliver healthcare. Because in the past, someone may come to the cardiologist or their family doctor with symptoms of an arrhythmia, uh, and from there, some tests are ordered, uh, like a Holter monitor, and you know those tests are done to try and de detect the arrhythmia. But now, wearables really 
uh, make this available to ever, anyone that wants to get the device. So anyone that may have symptoms can purchase a wearable device uh, and, and can use that device on their own to try and detect an arrhythmia. And if so, if they detect something, they can bring that to their physician for uh, interpretation. So I think it really gives us an opportunity to diagnose and identify more people that may have arrhythmias that uh, previously may have been missed because of uh, limited uh, or lesser accessibility. Now, that being said, I think there are also a lot of other benefits of wearable devices. Uh, and so this schematic here really, I think, highlights per perhaps many different benefits that wearable devices have for arrhythmia management and also specifically for atrial fibrillation. So starting on the top here, wearable devices may help us increase awareness of, um, of, of, uh, of heart conditions and of arrhythmia, so increasing public awareness of health conditions. They have a role in population screening. So perhaps, uh, and I'll show you some evidence or some, uh, uh, some uh, studies in the coming slides that we may be able to use these devices as a way to detect arrhythmias in the, in the general population. They certainly allow us potentially to detect AFib earlier. And so earlier detection of AFib may have implications. And uh, on the bottom here, we, AFib uh, detection may allow us to personalize your AFib care, uh, meaning that we can tailor your care, your treatments, your medications based on the symptoms and the triggers uh, of your atrial fibrillation. Uh, they may allow us to monitor disease-specific metrics, perhaps um, how often are you having your atrial fibrillation or how much of atrial fibrillation are you having uh, or uh, what are the triggers of your atrial fibrillation. These are all things that wearable devices may be able to provide us in the future. Um, improving health outcomes. We think that perhaps earlier uh, detection of uh, arrhythmias uh, may allow us to uh, you prevent a down or improve uh, downstream health outcomes. And then finally, on the top left here, I think wearable devices will help us improve or support healthy behaviors and facilitate lifestyle modification because a lot of these wearable devices have built-in features that uh, will be step counters or activity trackers that can help um, us and our patients and our, uh, the public work towards uh, improving the, uh, their lifestyle in general. Now, the next part of my talk is how do these wearables work? Because I've told you that there are many um, wearable devices that we have available, but how do these devices work and how exactly do they monitor our heart and detect arrhythmias? So to start off, most of these devices will use technology that we call photoplasmography or PPG for short. And how PPG works, I've shown you on the, on the bottom here, is that there's essentially a light emission from one part of the device that is emitted into the skin and that is, is reflected back to the det detector on the wearable device. And through that, the wearable device can estimate or uh, can, det can determine your heart rate. And that's very similar to technology that is used in you know, oxygen monitors that we use in hospital, for example. And so the PPG essentially allows the wearable device to record your heart rate uh, at any point in time. Uh, and now on top of that, a lot of these devices will have a accelerometer or a gyroscope to detect your physical activity. And it can pair that heart rate data with your activity level to tell you whether your heart rate may be abnormally high during a period of physical inactivity or abnormally low, for example. Now on top of that, a lot of these, or, or some, uh, some of these devices will also have the additional feature of recording a single lead ECG. Uh, and that can certainly have a lot more implications uh, in terms of diagnosing the specific arrhythmia uh, that someone may be experiencing. Now on the bottom here, this is an example of how that can be used uh, to detect an arrhythmia. So for example, this is uh, shared by a, a patient with their permission. Uh, and you can see here, this is a, someone that's using a, Gar a, a Garmin smartwatch. And you can see when they're in a normal rhythm, they have a nice um, increase in their heart rate uh, with exercise that peaks at around 150 beats per minute. But then when they're in the arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation, there's quite an erratic heart rate here that has substantial variability up and down. And that's one of the telltale hallmarks of someone being in atrial fibrillation. So this individual can use their smartwatch device to tell them that they're in atrial fibrillation. Now, of course, this device, uh, the, some of these smartwatches will also have ECG capabilities as well, as I mentioned. So this includes the Apple Apple Watch Series 4 and above, uh, the Fitbit Sense, Sense 2, uh, Charge 5, the Samsung Galaxy Watch, a Google Pixel Watch, and I'm sure many uh, new smart uh, watches are also incorporating these features as well. Uh, and so if, if this user can essentially record a single lead ECG by placing uh, both hands on the smartwatch. Uh, and this can essentially allow for an automated interpretation of what uh, their cardiac rhythm is, whether they're in a normal rhythm or in atrial fibrillation. And so this is an, another example of an, an individual that had an episode of atrial fibrillation uh, and they recorded on their smartwatch that they have AFib essentially confirming the diagnosis.
Now, there have been various studies that have shown that we can use these smartwatches as a means for detecting atrial fibrillation. So on this uh, slide here, I've summarized perhaps the, the three biggest studies in this domain from the from three big tech companies. Uh, Apple, uh, Huawei, and Fitbit have all used uh, and demonstrated that you can use their devices to detect AFib. So uh, in these mega studies that have run on anywhere from 200,000 to 450,000 individuals, you can see here that the notification rate and the AFib detection rate is somewhere in the range of 0.1%. So this is a very low AFib detection rate, but that's expected uh, because this is a generally healthy population that we're looking at. Uh, but it is a, in some ways a proof of concept to show that we can use these devices in the population as a way to detect atrial fibrillation. And it is a finding that is consistent across studies. Now, I, though, although I showed you that these smartwatch devices can work, I think it's still important to be very careful when you're using your uh, smartwatch device or wearable. Uh, because importantly, the accuracy of each device can vary. So each wearable device will have differing levels of accuracy uh, for arrhythmia diagnosis. And often they're only designed for perhaps one purpose and not may not be extrapolated to other purposes. Uh, and there also is the phenomenon of a false positive or a false negative finding uh, on, the, on the device. So a false positive finding is when we, uh, when the device tells you that something is going on and there's an alert from the device, but you actually do not have the arrhythmia. So that's a false positive because it's not, it's not real. And then on the other hand, a false negative is when the device tells you that there is nothing going on, there's no alert from the device, but you do have an arrhythmia. So that can sometimes provide false reassurance that nothing is going on. And so that was what we would call a false negative uh, when you have an, no alert, but you actually do have an arrhythmia. So important to be aware that those, those are some of the limitations or some of the challenges uh, that we have when using these devices. And now finally, there also is, of course, a lot of work and a lot of research to improve these devices. So wearable devices and smartwatches are increasingly incorporating artificial intelligence as a way to improve their functionality. So most of the commercially available smartwatches that I mentioned to you already are using artificial intelligence algorithms to improve their ability to detect AFib and to increase their diagnostic accuracy. Now, my last couple of slides, I just want to give you, uh, perhaps share with you a, a future of how wearables may shape our healthcare and how, how we deliver arrhythmia care. So perhaps imagine a future where your smartwatch can allow you to tell you when to take your medications. Now, certainly oh, for atrial fibrillation. Now, certainly this is not something that we recommend at this time, but this is something that's being studied uh, on ongoing trials uh, in, the, in the United States. And so certainly uh, may shape how we deliver arrhythmia care. Another example is imagine a future where your smartwatch can tell you how to manage your atrial fibrillation, and perhaps it can tell you when your ablation was successful or not. Uh, so this is an example of a study that we're running locally where uh, you can see that the, the Apple Watch has a new function called the AFib history function that records how much atrial fibrillation you're having uh, at any uh, during any point in time. And it can tell you someone is in atrial fibrillation all the time, and then when they have an ablation procedure, the atrial fibrillation drops to something that's undetectable. So imagine a future where your watch can help you manage your atrial fibrillation and can tell you uh, that your ablation was successful. Now to conclude, what is the future of wearable devices? Well, I think as we look forward, wearable devices will have more and more functions uh, and will come in all shapes and sizes. We already have them in smartwatches and they're coming down the line with uh, chest straps and with ECG shirts uh, that are becoming available. We'll have future studies that will incorporate wearables into your routine care. Uh, so wearables will uh, really increase the monitoring options that you have available and, and, and ultimately shape how we deliver cardiac and arrhythmia care. But that being said, I think it's always important to know that there are limitations that, and, and, and risks with some of these devices. Uh, when, whenever uh, the, when someone uses the device, there is a risk of more and more incidental findings with the wearable devices that may not have any significant meaning. And so wearable device users have to be aware that there are risks whenever you use a wearable device. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, thank you, uh, and for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you uh, very much, Chris. Um, I will be honest that at the end of your talk, I went on my Apple Watch, to, had a little quick check to make sure I was, whether I was in atrial fibrillation or not. And as of now, I'm in sinus rhythm, so that's good. Uh, but it is pretty cool how this technology works. So thank you for that. Uh, so just a reminder to everyone, we've had a few questions come in. Uh, if um, if you want to please send us any of your questions, please do so uh, online. Um, and so now I have the pleasure of introducing our final speaker for this evening. Dr. Maria Pericabras is also uh, a cardiac electrophysiologist within the Shirley Heart Program. 
Her research interests include emerging technologies and techniques for treating atrial fibrillation, including uh, things that are coming on the horizon called pulse field ablation, also known as PFA. Uh, as Dr. Singh uh, mentioned, Dr. Terry Cabas uh, runs or uh, works in our preclinical lab, so she does uh, she work does many of these procedures on people, but also looks at new ways of doing it uh, in, uh, in in animal models. She is uh, she works closely with patients and families to make sure they understand how interventions like ablation work and what factors can improve the success of the procedure. And she is very passionate about helping people with atrial fibrillation continue to do the things that they need, want, and love to do with their lives. And with that, Maria, over to you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me here tonight. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, perfect. So um, now it's my turn to talk about atrial fibrillation ablation. Um, and in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about um, how we can achieve normal sinus rhythm. Dr. Singh already talked about it, talked about medications and catheter ablation. So I'm going to review this very quickly, and I'm going to basically focus on catheter ablation, how it works, what we do, and why we do every step of the procedure. With the two current available technologies that we have, we're going to talk about complications, and I'm going to spend the last few minutes talking about these new technologies for atrial fibrillation ablation. So Dr. Singh already um, reviewed this. We have um, basically two ways to treat atrial fibrillation. We can rate control and we, we can do what we call rhythm control, which means return to normal sinus rhythm. And we can do this with catheter ablation and medications. And as I mentioned, I'm going to be focusing mostly on catheter ablation. We know that medications work, but they only work in 30 to 50% of the patients. And the reality is atrial fibrillation tends to be progressive. So even if they work at the very beginning, long-term, they tend to stop working. And the downside of medications is also that they have potential side effects. And unfortunately, the most effective one, which is called amiodarone, is also the most toxic. So what we know is that catheter ablation is more effective than medications to maintain sinus rhythm. And there are some old and some not so old studies that compared atrial fibrillation ablation with medications. And as you can see, they work better. But the big question that we always get is, am I gonna live longer if I undergo catheter ablation instead of going with medications? The reality is we don't have any data proving that it's gonna improve mortality. So you're gonna live longer because you undergo catheter ablation. There's only a small subgroup of patients, which are patients that also have heart failure in addition to atrial fibrillation, that they are gonna have an improvement in terms of mortality and also reduce risk of stroke long-term. So who are good patients to go for catheter ablation? The most important thing is we offer catheter ablation to patients who are symptomatic. And normally patients try medications first, um, but the problem is medications, they stop working, patients don't tolerate medications, and then catheter ablation comes to the picture. But there are some patients that also benefit from catheter ablation from the very beginning. For example, patients who have what we call conversion pauses, meaning that they are in atrial fibrillation, they go back to normal rhythm, but they have a pause leading to fainting um, when that happens. Then we wanna push for catheter ablation because we wanna to try to avoid a pacemaker. Patients who have congestive heart failure, like I mentioned before. Patients, for example, who have a defibrillator and because the heart goes very fast, they have inappropriate shock. And then we normally offer catheter ablation to patients who are younger than 80, 85 years of age. Not because we cannot do it in older population, just because the risk of a complication increases the older we get, and also because recovery from one of these complications might be a little bit more challenging. Then when we're offering a, an atrial fibrillation ablation, we also look at different parameters in the echocardiogram. So we're gonna talk about it, but we have focused mostly on the size of the left upper chamber called the left atrium, because if it's very, very enlarged, we know that you might not benefit for a catheter ablation because it might not work. And then it's also crucial that patients need to be on blood thinners. Most of our patients are on blood thinners because they have atrial fibrillation, but it's very, very important that we don't discontinue these blood thinners before and after the procedure. Now, I'm going to present 
what success of atrial fibrillation is and what the numbers are. But we have to keep in mind that when the clinical trials, when all the studies talk about success of atrial fibrillation ablation, what they mean is complete elimination of atrial fibrillation. Meaning that, for example, if a patient has literally 35 seconds of atrial fibrillation after an ablation procedure, it's considered a failure. Is that a real clinical failure? Probably the answer is no, because Imagine somebody who was in atrial fibrillation 24-7, very symptomatic, who couldn't even go out for a walk. We perform an ablation, and then seven months later, this patient has an episode of four minutes of atrial fibrillation. Was that a real failure? The answer is no. Uh, we definitely improved the quality of life. We improved the percentage of time that this person was in atrial fibrillation. So despite all the numbers you're going to see everywhere and all the clinical trials are going to give you these numbers, keep in mind what success means um, for atrial fibrillation. The other important thing that we have to keep in mind is how do we monitor the recurrences or if we have atrial fibrillation after the ablation? Because for the patient, what's most important is symptoms. And what we normally use is a Holter monitor that sometimes we do every three, every six, or every year months. But we can also wear wearables. And as Dr. Cheng was saying, um, we might detect a lot of episodes, we might have false, false positive, false negative. So we have to keep in mind that we can detect a lot of things that for the patient, it might not even be symptomatic. Now, these are the numbers. So we always talk about single procedure success. And the reason is some patients might have to come for a second or a third procedure because the first one didn't work and we need to touch up some things that didn't really uh, work for the first procedure. But when we talk about one single procedure, patients that came that were, ha were having atrial fibrillation then and they don't, this is what we normally quote. So for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which is this atrial fibrillation that comes and goes, it's about 60 to 80 percent. For persistent atrial fibrillation, meaning patients who are in atrial fibrillation most of the time or at least more than seven days, we normally quote 50 to 70 percent, probably closer to 50 and 60 than 70 percent. Now, again, does this mean that the procedure doesn't work for these patients? No, it does work in, for some of these patients because we know that the ablation, even if you have a little bit of atrial fibrillation afterwards, it reduces the time that a patient is in atrial fibrillation more than 90%. And only a reduction of 70%, meaning that you still have 30% of atrial fibrillation, it's already associated with an increased quality of life, which at the end of the day, that's what we're looking for. Now, how do we do it? So atrial fibrillation ablation, what we do is we perform ablation in the left atrium and we perform ablation around the pulmonary veins. So the pulmonary veins are the veins that bring the blood from the lungs to the heart. And we know from many years ago, actually from the late 90s, that the electrical impulses that start atrial fibrillation normally come from the pulmonary veins. So what we do is because patients can have more than one of these triggers or one day it's on one vein and the next day is in another vein, what we do is when a patient comes for an atrial fibrillation ablation, we perform what we call a pulmonary vein isolation. So we treat all four pulmonary veins because if one day one trigger is on another vein, we make sure that we treat all of them. And what we do is we create a small scar. And I, I emphasize that it's very small because it doesn't affect the overall function of the heart. We create a small heart around these veins and electrically speaking, we disconnect the veins from the heart. So even if these veins are firing and sending these electrical impulses, these, these impulses are gonna remain in the vein, are not gonna reach the heart and we're not gonna start having atrial fibrillation. And this part, we're working in the heart. This is a minimal invasive procedure. So we go from the groin, we use the femoral vein. Sometimes we use both femoral veins and we go up to the heart. We arrive in the right upper chamber, which is called the right atrium. But as I mentioned before, the important one where we're gonna be working most of the time is the left upper chamber or left atrium. And if you're wondering how we get there, what we do is uh, we perform a small puncture with a tiny little needle and we create a small hole that goes from the right to the left atrium. Don't worry because the hole closes in a matter of weeks. 
And in, in order to do this in a safe way, we use this tiny little catheter, which is actually an ultrasound probe, an echocardiogram, that is going to be sitting inside the heart all the time. And it's going to be showing us where our needle is, our catheters, and all our small tubes. So this is just an example. But here, what you can see is the right atrium, the left atrium. And this is the tiny little needle that's going to go across. So now we're in the left atrium. How are we going to perform this pulmonary vein isolation? We have two options. At Sunnybrook and most hospitals uh, have these two technologies. One is called the cryoablation. The other one is called radiofrequency. Cryoablation, what it does is it freezes. It freezes to minus 30, minus 40 degrees Celsius to create this small scar around the vein. And radio frequency burns. So it's a small catheter that point by point creates a line that also, um, electrically speaking, isolates the vein from the rest of the heart. And I like showing um, this image because this was an article that was published in 2016 that actually compared these two technologies in patients who have this type of atrial fibrillation called paroxysmal that comes and goes. And what the study showed is that these two technologies are equivalent in terms of safety and in terms of efficacy. So they are both good options for most of our patients. And despite the final result is very similar, technically the procedure is quite different. So the cryoablation, what we do is we advance this small tube to the left atrium and then this balloon that we inflate and then we push it against the pulmonary vein. And when we're sure that we're in contact, we freeze. We freeze for a few minutes and then we move to the next vein. And this is just to show that we use fluoroscopy, we use x-ray to guide this procedure. And you can see here the balloon, and this is one of the veins. Radio frequency is very different. So once we get to the left atrium, we use these catheters, which are literally like a brush, and we create a 3D, a 3D map of the left atrium, which includes the body of the left atrium, and these are the four, the four pulmonary veins. And once this is done, we use the ablation catheter, which is a very, very small catheter, to point by point create these lines around the veins and again isolate the veins from the rest of the heart. What is the best option? Um, they are both very good options. Um, they have pros and cons. So cryoablation is a faster procedure because it's a balloon that goes to the vein. And it does not require general anesthetic. So for these two reasons, generally the recovery is a little bit easier. It all depends on how much ablation we perform. What are the cons? First of all, it requires radiation. It's not a lot because hopefully patients are only going to come for one procedure, but it's something to keep in mind. It also requires contrast dye. It's a small quantity, and for most patients, that's not an issue. But for patients, for example, who have kidney issues, maybe we should consider another option. And also, it only allows us to perform ablation in the pulmonary veins because the catheter is especially designed to just go to the veins. And you may wonder, why do we need to perform more ablation? Well, some patients, for example, with history of heart failure, history of heart attacks, patients who have other types of arrhythmias, patients who had heart surgery, they might need ablation beyond the pulmonary veins. And if that's the case, then radio frequency is the way to go because it's going to allow us to perform ablation beyond the veins. The other advantage of radio frequency is that it does not require radiation. It doesn't mean that we don't use it. Sometimes we use some radiation, but definitely the exposure is less than the cryoablation. Uh, what are the cons from radio frequency? It's a longer procedure and it does require general anesthetic. Now, we understand what the success rates are. We know what we do. What's the risk of having a complication? Because some patients might say, if I'm unlucky and I'm that 20, 30 percent and I have a recurrence and I have to go back, at least I want to know that the risk of a complication is low. So the overall risk of a complication is between three and four percent. This includes absolutely everything, even a big bruise in the groin. But what's most important is the risk of a serious complication is less than two percent. And if you look at the graph on the right hand side, you can see that the vascular complication, which is normally not a, a very serious complication and non-severe complications are more than half of the complications that we normally get. What else can happen? So vascular complication, as I said, is the most common. It's, it's normally at the level of the groin where we perform the puncture. Um, Sometimes it needs intervention, sometimes it doesn't, but it, generally speaking, it's not a serious, a very serious complication. We can also cause a perforation. Perforation means that we create a small hole 
in the heart, leading to bleeding. This is a more serious complication, as you can imagine, but the advantages is that the heart is a muscle, and because it's a muscle, normally it can stop the bleeding on its own. It needs intervention. Patients need to stay in the hospital a few more days, but normally it doesn't cause um, long-term consequences. We can cause a stroke, like any procedure that we that we do on the left side of the heart. In order to prevent that, we give blood thinners throughout the procedure. But again, very unusual, but it can happen. And then other complications that, as you can see, are very unusual, and they are related to the fact that we're burning or freezing in the heart, but close to the heart, we have other structures, such as nerves and the esophagus. So things that can happen. Um, we can cause pulmonary vein stenosis, um, meaning that the pulmonary veins became, become narrower. That's, again, very unusual with the new technologies. We used to see it more in the past. It's also very unusual for patients who only undergo one procedure, but something to keep in mind because patients might experience shortness of breath afterwards. We can cause a phrenic nerve injury, and that's uh, that's a nerve that helps us breathing. Again, unusual. We take precautions for that, but it can happen. And one of the most important things is this, the atrosophageal fistula. And to all of our patients, we always remind them what the symptoms would be and what they have to look for. Very unusual complication, but if it happens, it's very important and very severe because it, it requires surgery right away. So what basically, what this is, is um, the esophagus is the foot pipe and the foot pipe is very close to the heart. It runs behind the heart. So when we burn or we freeze, we can create a connection between the heart and the, and the esophagus. And that, as you can imagine, is a very severe complication that we always have to keep in mind, but also remember that it's very unusual. And this is a study that looked at the temporal trend. So you can see um, between 2013 and 2017, and this is between 2018 and 2022, the overall number of complications has gone down dramatically. And most importantly, the severe complications have gone down. And this is because we've had a lot of technological improvements. We have contact force catheters that tell us all the time how much force we're applying, mapping systems, intracardiac imaging, vascular ultrasound, and all these are helping us not only to improve our success rates, but also to decrease the number of complications. And we've done a lot over the years. We've been doing um, radio frequency for more than 20 years, cryoablation for more than 10 years. And the question that sometimes we get is, did we did we reach the roof? Like, can we do anything better? Can we do anything different? So here's where um, new technologies come to the picture. So when we're talking about radio frequency and cryoablation, we always have to keep in mind that we need to find a balance between safety and efficacy. Sometimes we want to make sure that the patients don't come back for a second procedure, but if we ablate too much, we might cause more complications. So pulse field ablation is a complete new technology, a new energy source that hopefully it's going to increase safety a little bit while maintaining the same efficacy as the technologies that we currently have. And what pulse field ablation, and you might hear the, the name PFA, um, what it is, is uh, we apply electric current to the heart and this creates a very small pores that kill the cells. And this is new for us, but this has been used for cancer treatment, for example, for many, many years. And the advantage of this PFA technology is that the heart is more susceptible to PFA than the surrounding structures, meaning that we're not going to damage the nerve or the esophagus. And hopefully we're going to maintain the same efficacy. And I'm saying hopefully because we had the very beginning of this technology. So a few months ago, we uh, we got the first paper, the first article that actually compared these three technologies. It compares the cryo, which is the freezing, the radio frequency, which is the burning, and the PFA. And what we know is that the efficacy is pretty much the same, around 70%. What about safety, which is what we're looking for? So the reality is that um, this study only included 300 patients that went for uh, PFA, 150, 150 that went for the other technologies. So keeping in mind that the incidence of these complications is very low, it's difficult to actually see if it's better or not with such a small number of patients. But the advantage is we're late. 
and the Europeans have been using this technology for about two years. And the advantage of that is that we have all the data from Europe. So this is the study that I was talking about, 300 patients. And this is a registry, a European registry, that monitored more than 1,500 patients that underwent an AFib ablation with using this, proceed, this technology. And as you can see, zero esophageal fistulas, zero pulmonary vein stenosis, very low mortality, and only one single patient who had injury to the phrenic nerve. And we even have more data. This is not published yet, but the, the results um, have been presented. The same group, another registry, more than 17,000 patients. And it's very reassuring because you can see that the major adverse events is less than 1%, no cases of damages to the esophagus, no pulmonary vein narrowing, and no damage to the phrenic nerve. There are gonna be many, many systems coming. Um, currently in Canada, only the Pulse Electrum Medtronic, which is this one here, is commercially approved, but I'm not aware if any hospitals already have it. Ferropulse is going to come soon, and I'm sure that in the next few months and obviously years, um, we're going to have many others. Are they all the same? No. Are they similar? Yes. And we'll all have to figure out what's the best option for our patients. So uh, I'm going to summarize the last 20 minutes. Um, I just want to remind that everybody that catheter ablation is safe and effective, and it has proven to be superior to medications. And despite our success rates are between 50 and 70 percent, we do achieve a significant improvement in quality of life. And another important thing to always remember is that the serious complications are less than 2 percent. We currently use cryoablation and radiofrequency, and we know that these two technologies are equivalent and safe for most of our patients. For some patients, one might be better than another, but this is something that you can discuss with your cardiologist. And finally, we're, exciting to, we're excited to see what happens with this new technology, pulse field ablation, that seems to be safer and at least as effective as the technologies that we currently have. And that's it. Um, I think we're all ready for questions. Thank you. Uh Thank you uh, so much, Maria, and thank you all of you. Uh, that concludes the formal presentations. And so we're gonna now begin the question and answer portion. We're running uh, ahead of schedule, so we have quite a bit of time. So if you would like to submit a question, uh, you can still do so. We have a few questions that have been submitted that we'll go through. And maybe I'll start with asking uh, Dr. Seng, Sheldon, just to give our audience uh, an appreciation of the number of atrial fibrillations that we do at Sunnybrook a year, just so that people know how common uh, a procedure this is. Yeah, you know, this is the most common ablation that's done in Canada, um, North America, uh, not globally, because there are many centers, um, uh, international centers that don't have the technology because it's obviously costly technology. Um, at Sunnybrook, we do around 200 of these a year. Um, and those are the complex atrial fibrillation ablation procedures where we're targeting the pulmonary veins. Um, but we also do the simple ablations or the AV node ablations in patients with pacemakers. Um, we do not a lot of those, but there's evolving data that that simple procedure that we used to do many years ago actually is highly effective in many patients, both for symptoms and reducing hospitalization. Great, thank you. And with the, the new EP suite, uh, hopefully that number will go up by quite a bit because there are patients who are waiting for this, aren't there? Correct. Um, so the first question, and maybe I'll ask uh, Sheldon this one because it relates to your talk. Um, is this condition genetic? Yeah, so, you know, the genetics for atrial fibrillation are actually quite complex. And, you know, some of the work has been done in families where there's a large predilection for atrial fibrillation, particularly at a young age, um, uh, mainly patients who have atrial fibrillation in their 40s. And there are some genes which have been identified, um, which are associated with atrial fibrillation, but we don't really know what the true penetrance, the inheritance pattern is. There are other lifestyle factors that can contribute to it to make it um, more likely that you'll develop clinical atrial fibrillation. Um, so we just don't know what to do with the genetics. We know that if a first degree relative has atrial fibrillation, you have an increased risk of having it, but that doesn't mean that we do anything preventative. 
much like heart disease in general, we tell patients to have a healthy lifestyle, maintain their weight, ensure their blood pressure is well managed. Um, and you know, if there are a group of uh, from family members who have atrial fibrillation, then they would be someone that we would kind of look to um, doing research and to study their genetics to understand and get more appreciation of how this plays a role in their uh, So, Maria, I'm going to ask a question that I'm sure all of your patients ask, all three of you. In your patients with atrial fibrillation, what do you tell them about alcohol? So I normally tell them to reduce it as much as possible. And it's it's challenging because we're treating the atrial fibrillation to improve quality of life. And, and some small quantity of alcohol is also part of a lot of patients' quality of life. So realistically, what I normally say is to reduce as much as possible to avoid those days like Christmas, weddings, in which we drink two or three times what we would drink in a month so definitely th that can act as a trigger it's true that the data shows that ideally we should stop completely alcohol but i also know that it can be challenging for a lot of people so i what i normally recommend is to reduce it and to avoid big amounts of alcohol chris is that what you tell your patients when they ask yeah that's pretty similar to what i would tell my patients as well i think you know, in the end, this is, uh, it's it's about quality of life too. And that's also why we do a lot of our treatments is to improve someone's quality of life. So, you know, for some people having a little bit of alcohol is important for their quality of life. And I don't want them to you know, have, affect their quality of life that way. But at the same time, we do know that alcohol is perhaps the one trigger that has been shown in the literature to be the one thing that can trigger a fib. So if it's reasonable to reduce it, I think people should, but we also uh, that's why we talk about that there are other options available for treating AFib. We talk about medications that we can use to reduce the likelihood of getting an AFib episode. And that's why we talk about ablation as an option as a way to control AFib. So it's kind of talking to someone and, and combining all of those as options uh, as and, and finding the best way forward. What about exercise? What do you tell them about strenuous exercise or exercise in general if they have atrial fibrillation? Is that a good idea, a bad idea? It's a, it's a great question. I think, uh, you know, everyone's, uh, so they have done some studies in the past where they've asked people to report the triggers that they have for their atrial fibrillation event. So they've had um, so patients have smartphones that uh, essentially every time they have an AFib event, they try to avoid it and to see if that would prevent the AFib trigger. And what, what that's essentially identified is that everyone has their own trigger for atrial fibrillation. Now, alcohol perhaps is the one that is consistent across studies, but apart from alcohol, everyone seems to have their own trigger. So some people have AFib that may be triggered when they sleep. Um, other people may have AFib that's triggered when they exercise or when they drink coffee. Uh, and so I usually tell patients to try to, if they know that they have a trigger that triggers their AFib, that to, it, it seems prudent to avoid that trigger if possible. Now, that, that may not be exercise for a lot of people. A lot of people can exercise with no problem. Um, but if someone knows that they, you know, coffee or, or exercise or, or, um, or alcohol is the specific trigger for them, then I tell them that that's probably best to avoid it in their case. Thank you. Uh, so, Sheldon, how do you gauge the success of your treatment option, whether that be ablation or medications? Uh, does a patient have to be completely free of atrial fibrillation? Like what, what's, what's, uh, what's your approach and what's the approach in studies and, and the field? Yeah, you know, I think um, uh, I'm glad that you differentiate the two studies and, you know, our clinical approach. And there are two completely different um, approaches. In, in studies, obviously, you want to prove the, prove the effectiveness of the strategy that you've taken. And the effectiveness typically and traditionally has been elimination of atrial fibrillation. Um, you know, that's a very difficult um, uh, metric because that would entail monitoring patients 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, which is impossible. So even these metrics that look at elimination of atrial fibrillation, they have some flaws to them. But in general, studies like to lower the bar and say 30 seconds of atrial fibrillation um, is considered a failure, or that's traditionally what it's been, simply because they can't monitor patients all the time. We've learned from more recent studies where patients have had devices implanted in them where you can accurately monitor atrial fibrillation that burden's a big deal. And a reduction in the burden of atrial fibrillation is associated with reduced hospitalizations um, and improved clinical outcomes. So in general, you know, 
what I like to, to, to look at uh, in terms of the outcomes for my patients are improvement in symptoms, reduction, and ideally elimination of hospitalizations, and preferably the lowest burden possible on a Holter monitor. Um, you know, I don't subject patients to frequent Holter monitors because most of our patients remain on blood thinners for a long period of time. In patients where the ask is to come off their blood thinners for a number of reasons, and I'm a bit more regimented and I tend to have a higher threshold in terms of the AF burden, or sorry, a lower threshold from the AF burden before I call it success or failure because the consequence of missing AFib is not just a hospitalization, but potentially a stroke. And that's something which I want to avoid. So it depends on the clinical context um, and what the patient, um, the, what their symptoms are and what their motivation for undergoing the procedure was in the first place. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, Dr. Teragapis, you, you talked about a lot of the different types of ablations that are done and the new technologies. When do you recommend medications? What is it about a patient that uh, you would recommend medications as opposed to ablation? So the reality is um, our guidelines, which are actually quite old, but they still recommend to try first medications. Now, a lot of patients are not going to tolerate them. A lot of patients, for example, are young and they don't want to be on medications long term. So we normally try medications first before we jump into an ablation. There are some exceptions for that. But definitely, we have to try most of the times because our waiting lists are so long that patients, not so long, but are long. It's not that we see a patient on Monday and the following Monday, they are going to go for an ablation. So sometimes even patients who come and say, I want an ablation instead of, of being on medications long term, we end up putting them on medications, at least for the time that they want to wait for it. Other times that we might try medications, it's probably patients who are maybe older or more fragile that we're more concerned about the complications associated to the atrial fibrillation ablation procedure. We might kind of push more for medications instead of an ablation. And yeah, probably I think that's when we would recommend medications. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, Chris. Does the amount of time you've been in atrial fibrillation make a difference? So if somebody just got diagnosed, but when they see their physician, they say, you've probably been in this for a long time, should they should that change uh, the decision to have ablation or change the confidence that medications or treatment will, will be successful? Thanks, Rindra. That And that's a great question. I think you know, that is that is a quite an individualized uh, question because, you know, time in, in, in arrhythmia or time in AFib certainly is one of the things that we consider uh, when we when we uh, talk about controlling the medic the atrial fibrillation with medication. So if someone has been in atrial fibrillation for a very long time, it may mean that we're less likely to be able to get you out of it. Um, because sometimes over time, the heart can change to keep someone in atrial fibrillation. And so it, it does make our treatments harder to achieve you to bring them back in sinus rhythm. Um, but that being said, I think it's very, it's very an individualized decision because in some patients, um, they may have been in atrial fibrillation for a long time, but there may not have been a lot of changes to their heart over those years uh, or, or months or years, depending on how long they've been in it. So we try to individualize that um, decision and really assess um, each patient based on what, what we see, based on their ultrasound results, based on um, other findings as well. Um, I often do say that we, we often do try to see if someone can tolerate or keep stay in normal rhythm. So sometimes one thing that we try to do is we try to convert someone back from atrial fibrillation to normal rhythm and we see how they do. We see how um, how they maintain normal rhythm. If their heart wants to stay in normal rhythm when we do uh, a cardioversion procedure, that's a different procedure where we, we, we shock the heart back to normal rhythm and we see how likely are they to go back in AFib or stay in normal rhythm. Uh, and we also at the same time assess how do they feel? Does, some, does someone feel better in normal rhythm or do they feel the same or unchanged? And so those are all factors that we consider when we uh, think about AFib as if someone has been in it for a long time. Now, that being said, the other caveat is that we also know that treating AFib earlier is perhaps better uh, and perhaps treating uh, and keeping someone in normal rhythm is better. And this is something that is becoming more and more prominent over the years is that in the past, we thought that you know being in AFib or being in normal rhythm didn't make a difference. But now there's more evidence to say that perhaps being in normal rhythm has benefits in the long term. So certainly if we have someone that is 
coming in uh, and with a new diagnosis of AFib, we certainly uh, put our heads together and think about what is the best way forward uh, and certainly consider uh, trying to get them back into normal rhythm. Great. So bottom line is people need to be evaluated by a specialist so that uh, an individual plan can be uh, developed. So you did mention cardioversion and shocking someone, which I'm sure everyone in the audience has seen on television. Uh, can you tell us what that is like um, for this condition? Uh, just so the people in, uh, people in the audience have a sense of uh, what, what it is, and it may not be what they're seeing on TV. <laughs> Absolutely. So probably not as dramatic as what people see on TV. <laughs> this is much more of a controlled environment. So what, what a cardioversion is, is a cardioversion is it was essentially a shock to the heart to reset the heart back to normal rhythm. So for people that are in atrial fibrillation constantly, so some people may be in AFib sometimes and they go in and out, um, but in people that are in AFib constantly, we sometimes will do what we call a cardioversion procedure to Shock, the, shock their heart back to normal rhythm. And so this is a safe procedure that we do. Um, and what happens is that people come in, it's a, essentially a day procedure where uh, they come in, um, they meet our anesthesiologist uh, and uh, they receive a little bit of sedation to go uh, to sleep. And we do a, sh a single shock to often reset the heart back to normal rhythm. Again, not, not dangerous and it does reset the heart and often will bring the heart back to normal rhythm from AFib. And sometimes it just takes that extra jolt uh, to get the heart back to normal rhythm. And then after that, we can determine how do they feel? And so it's important after a cardioversion for us to assess, do you feel better in normal rhythm compared to an atrial fibrillation? And if you feel better, if you feel more energetic, you feel less palpitations, you feel less symptoms related to the atrial fibrillation, then that may mean that you may be someone that benefits from us trying to keep you in normal rhythm. And then that goes down the line of the options that we have available, like medications and ablation. Now for other people, they may feel no different or they, their heart may wanna go right back into atrial fibrillation. And for those individuals, perhaps, going down the line of medications and AFib ablation is perhaps less worthwhile. And so that's a, it's a very important modality that we use to assess how well the heart wants to go back to normal rhythm um, and how well it wants to stay in normal rhythm and whether we should go down the line of medications and ablation. All right, thank you. Um, so Sheldon, a um, couple of questions for you. What do you tell patients about driving? Um, it's a good question. I think, you know, um, uh, it's a complex question because we have patients who have commercial license, patients who have private license, and, you know, beyond driving, we have patients who have pilot's license, right? And um, atrial fibrillation definitely does impact your ability to safely impact uh, to drive the um, vehicles and uh, planes. The recommendations are a little bit different for private and um, uh, commercial license and airlines. In general, if you have poorly controlled rates in atrial fibrillation, we typically recommend not driving. And in some situations, particularly with commercial license, we will actually report the license. In atrial fibrillation, we think about fast heart rates, but you can also paradoxically have slow heart rates. And the conversion pauses that Dr. Tara Kravis had mentioned, where the heart will go fast and stop for a period of time, that's also something that we get concerned about in patients who have symptoms of lightheadedness and almost fainting, which we believe due to that, um, that's another reason for us to hold um, light, uh, a driver's license until appropriate therapy is put into place. Um, so in, in general, you know, there are rules about restricting driving and flying, but the flip side is that there are also effective therapies to control your atrial fibrillation. So for the most part, we're able to get patients on appropriate therapies be it drug therapy or in a situation of slow heart rates, pacemakers to kind of mitigate the risk associated with atrial fibrillation to not withhold their ability to drive and fly planes, et cetera. Uh, there's a question uh, that we have about the ablation procedure. Is it, is it a day procedure? Do patients have to stay overnight? What do you usually recommend for your patients and what do most of your patients have? Yeah, at, at Sunnybrook, our atrial fibrillation ablation procedures are day procedures. Patients typically come in the morning of the procedure. Um, a procedure takes around four hours. We monitor their groins for to make, which is where we enter the to get into the body. And if there's no bleeding, they typically go home about four hours later and we start their medications. We're very fortunate to have seasoned nurses who look after patients before and after and look for complications. They educate patients about the, the signs and symptoms to watch out for. Um, and we've been doing this, you know, since the pandemic. And um, we discharge at least 90% of our AFib patients 
we have very few coming back to the emergency department. Um, and most of them, you know, actually enjoy going home. It's much nicer to sleep in your own bed after a long procedure than staying in a hospital bed. Um, uh, but that's been our approach. It's a growing approach. And, you know, with great nursing staff to help us, um, we're able to do this successfully. Um, Maria, we, we talked a bit about alcohol. Are there any other foods uh, that you talk about with your patients or they ask you that they should avoid that are known to be related to atrial fibrillation? So I, I, I normally start the conversation the other way around because a lot of patients have, uh, and, and Chris talked about it, they have triggers and they can clearly identify one food or or something that they do that starts atrial fibrillation. And for example, I've had patients that chocolate, for example, because it has a little bit of mm. caffeine started atrial fibrillation, or definitely coffee is associated, alcohol is associated. So generally, I don't recommend to do any changes to the diet unless they recognize that there's a specific trigger that starts their episodes of atrial fibrillation. But what I do recommend is to do a healthy diet, because we know that patients who are overweight or who have obesity, that's associated with worse outcomes, not even for the ablation. Also, it, it's more difficult to control their atrial fibrillation. So that's the general recommendation that I give, unless the patient can recognize what their triggers are. So Chris, we've, we've had previous sessions, a uh, series on cardiac surgery, and certainly we've, we've talked about atrial fibrillation happening after cardiac surgery. Is ablation a therapy for that? Or how does one usually treat or deal with ablation, uh, deal with atrial fibrillation that's, that comes from something like cardiac surgery? Thanks, Sarendra. And, and that is a great question. I think, you know, atrial fibrillation can happen and present in many different forms. So it can happen spontaneously. It can happen in someone that um, incidentally finds that they are in atrial fibrillation, but it can also be sometimes triggered by an event like cardiac surgery uh, or hospitalization for an acute illness or for a pneumonia. And so sometimes we have to really look closely and see, you know, is that perhaps an atrial fibrillation episode that was triggered uh, by the initial, by the event itself? And was it a, perhaps a very major surgery that someone went through uh, or a major hospitalization or a, a, a hospitalization that, that may have triggered the event? Or is it actually arising because they already had changes in their heart um, that were putting them at risk for atrial fibrillation and it just happened that it manifests at that time? So that's, those are some of the things that we think about when we see events like atrial fibrillation happen after a hospitalization. Was we think about, is it triggered by the uh, uh, event itself? Was it a severe event? Or, or could it have been actually just come out uh, incidentally because they, someone already had the changes in their heart or the risk factors, we say, uh, for AFib, and it just presented itself at that time? So often what we do is we monitor those individuals closely, and we often see them in follow-up to see if that AFib comes back. Uh, and if it becomes an ongoing problem, then that's when we start thinking about how can we best manage it uh, with medications and, and, and other things like procedures. Great, thank you. Um, um, so Sheldon, you spoke uh, a bit about atrial fibrillation and strokes, uh, that it can cause strokes. What about the other way around? Is, is that one of the types of conditions that can, in a hospitalization that can lead to AFib or we usually, does that, cross your mind or is it usually just the other way? Yeah, you know, I, I, think, I think there are a couple of things to think about with regards to that interplay between stroke and atrial fibrillation. You know, as Dr. Chung just mentioned, any hospitalization is associated with atrial fibrillation just by the fact that you have a medical illness and you're in hospital. So it's possible that the act of you having a stroke, you've come into hospital, you may develop atrial fibrillation independent of that stroke. We also have to appreciate that some of the risk factors for stroke, diabetes, high blood pressure, getting older, are also the risk factors for atrial fibrillation. And it could just be that you have these two situations which coexist with one another. But the one thing that patients who have stroke have to will actually realize is that if you've had a stroke and never had atrial fibrillation before, quite frequently your stroke neurologist will hunt for atrial fibrillation and do different monitors to look for it. And in this situation here, they're looking for subclinical atrial fibrillation or atrial fibrillation, which you don't actually know about, but may have happened and resulted in you having this stroke. And that's important because as I mentioned before, many patients with atrial fibrillation don't have symptoms of this and don't know they have it. So in that situation, we often will look for it because it may be a cause for your stroke, even though you weren't fully aware of it. Okay, 
Thanks, Sheldon. Uh, and maybe this will be our last question. It's a bit of a tough one. Okay. And you commented on how you gauge success by symptoms. Um, can you tell us your experience of patients who come to you who have who have atrial fibrillation, have have symptoms such as shortness of breath or palpitations, but also fatigue, really big fatigue. In your experience with ablation and these other therapies, how does that translate to the fatigue? Is it something that you tell your patients to expect that to get better? How do you how do you give advice on that? It's a very tough one because fatigue's a very generic kind of symptom. It can be due to a number of things. So if a patient comes to me with AFib and fatigue, there are a number of things that go through my head. The first is, is the fatigue related to the atrial fibrillation? If it is, one way I can go about trying to figure this out is the cardioversion. Try to get mm. some to normal rhythm to see if the fatigue gets better. If the atrial fibrillation is paroxysmal, so it starts and stops on its own, you get a whole term monitor to correlate their symptoms with what their rhythm is. For example, if someone's fatigued all the time, but they have brief episodes of atrial fibrillation, I wonder if the fatigue is unrelated to the atrial fibrillation. The second thing I ask myself is, are these patients on therapies for atrial fibrillation, which actually can make them fatigued? So a culprit drug is a beta blocker. Beta blockers are associated with fatigue. Or are you now put on a medication and concomitant with that, you've developed fatigue. Thirdly, along the lines of those medications, is your heart rate now very slow due to a side effect of the medications and as a result of having that slowing of the heart rate, you're fatigued. So I think there are multiple things to think about. And I think, you know, you have to have a comprehensive approach to the patient to also understand, you know, are there other medical conditions? For example, are you on a blood thinner to prevent stroke, but you have a predisposition to bleeding and we don't know about this. So comprehensive assessment, looking at your hemoglobin, looking at other blood tests to see what may be associated or causing your fatigue, I think is worthwhile. So difficult question. There are some associations with AFib, AFib therapies and fatigue, but you know you have to have a broader approach in these sorts of patients. Thanks, Sheldon, for, uh, for really a, a kind of nuanced answer to that tough question. Um, so we've come to the conclusion of our uh, question and answer. We had quite a lot of questions and really thank you to everyone in the audience for sending them, uh, sending them in. Uh, just a few more points before we wrap up for the evening. Uh, please uh, take a moment to fill out the electronic evaluation form because that's really very helpful to us in planning future talks and topics for you. Uh, you can also add your name to our mailing list for future talks. Um, I once again like to thank Sheldon, Maria, and Chris uh, for really an incredibly informative uh, evening. Uh, I, I uh, learned a lot, and I hope uh, everyone in the audience did too. Uh, special thank you to Manish Mehta from our board for providing welcoming remarks. And really a big thank you to everybody in the audience for joining us for this educational event. Uh, please make sure to check out our upcoming topics, which will be shared on the speaker series website. And with that, uh, I'll thank you again and wish you all uh, a wonderful evening.